and 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 the only thing that people see in Kamala is that brief interview with Jeff Sessions while the while the cameras was on, and that was her star moment to sock it to him and say, "Now you know if you can interview that man like that, you should have interviewed Paul Tanaka, which was the undershelf to Lee Baca." You should have done Lee Baca the same way. And when he had to step down, you should have held Jim McDonald the same accountability. Like, okay, this is where they left off at. I'm going to hold you accountable to finish the investigation and make it impartial and make it fair and bring it to us. None yeah. of that happened. They're yeah. busy having lunch and on the golf course they're having fun. Now let me ask so- All right, what you're hearing is a segment of a conversation uh, from Breaking Brown. Yvette Carnell, and she's interviewing the father of uh, Mitrice Richardson, who essentially died at the hands of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department in Southern California. I watched uh, this presentation a few days ago and actually listened to it more than once, watched it more than once. And first of all, I want to give uh, kudos to uh, Yvette Brown and Breaking Brown and her efforts at uh, providing journalism from a black first standpoint, black media. And second of all, I want to, um, maybe most paramount in all this is, uh, well, the, the case still hasn't been solved. And it, 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 it affects me, and I'm, I think about it because, well, this reminds me of my experience in Southern California. <clears throat> it reminds me of my experience of actually working in an adjacent area for a number of years that I have. And through this media here in the Cogenevis Chronicles, I didn't necessarily want to delve into my personal life very much at all. Just wanted to keep it uh, somewhat neutral. But I am reminded of some prior experiences of myself that I had with members of the L.A. County Sheriff's Department. And this brings home a point as it relates to Kamala Harris and her uh, candidacy for United States President for President of the United States. It's all under, it was all under her watch that this happened, you see, and she should have investigated this case. She was given an opportunity to do it. She was contacted. Her office was contacted, etc. But she did nothing. She did nothing. So that's what this is going to be somewhat about today because I wanted to actually highlight my experiences that I've had with members of that agency, which is the largest sheriff's department in the United States, largest law enforcement agency in the United States. And it's had its litany, it's had its share of problems in all throughout the past 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of its existence, even longer than that, especially as it relates to black people and the treatment of black people in Los Angeles and greater Los Angeles area. So allow for me to uh, really share my thoughts and my sentiments having to do with this, this, this whole thing revolving around how they treat people, how they've been treating people, and how they still treat people to this day. And more notably, this case involving uh, the death of Mitrice Richardson, which is still unsolved. I you a question. I remember, I remember a young lady... Natalie, I think it was Natalie Holloway. Everybody, she was on an island somewhere, wasn't even here, that, and it, that was a huge investigation. I want to ask you this before you go. If, if, if my trees, if your daughter had been white, do you think this would have made a difference? Hell yeah, it would have made a difference, with no doubt. First of all, it wouldn't have never happened. Mm. It, would, it wouldn't have never happened if my trees was white. See, what they were banking on was the fact that she was black, she had an address of Los Angeles uh, near South Central, and they underestimated her family. Mm. They thought that she, they didn't know how to 
diagnose her as having a mental breakdown or bipolar. They thought it was some substance, and she came out there from South Central to do what she did, and, and it happened. They did not think in a million years that she was a college graduate with honors, um, that she had a father that was going to take this to the next 40 years till I get justice, that her mother was about something, her stepfather was about something, her stepmother is about something. They didn't, they didn't take none of this in consideration. So I know somewhere, somehow, when they sat down at the table and they kept getting this and they keep coming up, I know they say, we messed up using the F word. Mm. I know. And they know all the time that we're not going to let it go. We're not. Okay. Well, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to thank you, um, for, for deciding and, and, and to, to come on. That is, that is my treatise mother. I put up on that from a, from an article. I got that on. Um, I want to, I want to thank you for coming on and having the conversation. Um, and you know, the, the, the breaking Brown family stands with you. We, we support you. Um, and you know, and I just, you know, and, and we want to do everything that we can to kind of highlight what justice looks like for us like not like not like some grand we're united whatever but justice for a specific group and in your case a specific person your daughter and so you know what whatever little bit that we could do um to push that forward into the conversation today we are happy to do it and we are thankful that you decided to come on sir so we appreciate you Hey, I appreciate you guys, too. Every little bit is going to help. And uh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you, sir. We'll be in contact. I appreciate you. All right. Have a good night. You, too. I, I, I you know, Breaking Brown family. You know, I I don't even know. Like, I don't, I, but I want to I wanna play something. I want to play something because, you know, parents do, parents do the best that they can because this is their child. So they do the best that they can to um, to be tough and to do what they can to gain justice for their children. That's what they do. And I appreciate I appreciate Mr. Richardson coming on and doing just that. But I want to show you, I want to bring to your attention while he's off the line, because I don't want him to have to hear none of this. I want to play for you the calls that my Teresa's mother made to the police department and the calls that were made about her, which make it fairly obvious that they said, somebody said that like she was, she was talking about, she was from Mars and she was there to avenge like Michael Jackson. She was obviously, these are telltale signs of like, this person is having a mental health crisis. She did a sobriety check. She wasn't drunk. And she had parents who cared about her. So what I'm going to do just right now is just play you that audio so that you really sort of begin to understand what actually happened. So give me a few minutes and then we'll, we'll be right back. Okay. Do, do you know if she's, if she's here now or was she released? They said she was released. Okay. And what time was she released? Um, at, at just shortly after 12 a.m. Yeah, normally I we wouldn't I wouldn't recommend doing one uh, that soon. See, this is where this is where things went wrong. The mother calls in to the Lost Hills Station to find out Lost Hills L.A. County Sheriff Station. It's an area that, uh, it's a pretty large area that they cover. They cover uh, pretty much an affluent region of Southern California. That's almost along the county line uh, near Ventura County line. I'm familiar with that. Very familiar with that. That area, that whole region. It goes from the coast, uh, Zuma Beach, Malibu, Los Angeles County side of uh, Westlake Village, Agoura Hills, etc. And the mother of uh, Mytrice, Mytrice's mother, uh, called in to find out the status of her daughter to see if she can somehow arrange to either pick her up to find out her status since she was actually brought in as an arrestee. 
Now, you're going to hear some terms that sound like terms uh, that are related to law enforcement. So it's it's no secret anymore that uh, I have prior affiliation with this type of thing, and I know about these these particular topics. Just to speculate even more, because, you know, it's, it's all speculation at this point now, and it's fairly easy for me to say what could have been done or what should have been done because this was just wrong all the way around from the initial contact of this young woman to her being arrested as opposed to being detained and taken in for a mental health assessment to a county mental health center in the region that was likely open and available to render assessment on this young lady, to render an assessment on this young lady where she would have been released after an assessment was done. And that release would have, well, it would have required someone to come pick her up or if she was deemed fit to be released, Arrangements could have been made at that point. However, arresting her and taking her to jail, to a jail facility, for nothing that seems to be existent in terms of a crime. I mean, from from what I understand, it was this she was called over a suspicion that she'll she dine would dine and dash, and it was a ninety dollar, eighty nine dollar tab. But there were some statements that apparently that were made that she made that were, seemed kind of bizarre and off-putting. So at that point, there were concerns about her sobriety. Deputies arrived, conducted a sobriety test, and determined that she wasn't under the influence of anything. So instead of taking her in for a mental health evaluation by some professionals... They instead took her to a detention facility, a jail facility, facility, a jail substation, that being Lost Hills Sheriff Station. And I believe it's in uh, Calabasas, if I'm not mistaken. And that distance was roughly 20 minutes or so through canyon roads, unless they took the freeway around. But there were highways that they took and it probably took them in excess of 20, 25 minutes to reach the station. Certainly more than 10 or 15 minutes. So they take her to the station, book her into the jail, and she's released despite the appeals made by the by this young woman's parents to, to say, don't release her until we come pick her up type of deal. Here's more. Um, right, what is the time frame? You know, I, I guess probably 24 hours would be reasonable. I mean, if, if there would be some some mitigating factors, you know, where, you know, you su would suspect maybe something. The mitigating factor would be a lone female out during the hours of darkness in a fairly undeveloped suburban area, mostly, mostly wooded canyons, Two-lane highways, no bus service. At the time, there was no Uber. Okay, okay. so there was no rideshare service that she could have taken. She could have taken a cab, but it would have costed an inordinate amount of money because the area that the station is located is fairly remote by comparison. It's, it's not in, in the middle of the, of the city. It's not you know what you would think to be in a Los Angeles in a major metropolitan area. It's on the outskirts. And what should have more likely been done is a missing persons report. Yeah. What does it take to file a missing persons report? Just a few few keystrokes. Just a few keystrokes. Load the information in the national system. At which time a bolo would have been put out. A radio broadcast of a be on the lookout for this individual would have been broadcast over over radio airwaves different departments throughout the area, throughout that particular area, which there are several 
a number of different agencies, including the next county over to the north and the west. Well, yeah, right. She doesn't know the area. She's never been in your area before. Where, where do you? Where does she live? She is unfamiliar with that area. Do you she think she not, possibly could have gotten a bus home? No. And oh, listen, my child has never ridden a bus. Okay. No, right. she would not know how to ride a bus. <laughs> I would probably wait till you know early this morning, and if she doesn't turn up, you can certainly call. I don't suspect anything. Um, bad happened. I'm concerned because, uh, well, first of all, I thought they were going to keep her overnight because she was highly intoxicated. Mm -hmm. um, something, something is obviously going on with her. Have you she talked tried, to the jailer? And yes, 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 I have. He said he tried to get her to save her because she was an adult. They had to let her go. I, I believe that she is highly depressed, um, and she, she, she's in a depressive state. You know, it could be possible that maybe she, I mean, there's a lot of options and I, a lot of possibilities, and I don't think all of them would be, um, you know, something dire, but I can certainly understand your fears, you know, being... Okay, what's obvious to me is, is the, the woman's crying over the phone. She's obviously despondent. She's upset. Okay, my Teresa's mother is on the phone appealing to this, uh, I guess this is the jail, the watch commander or the, the, the person responsible for the Los Jail Station Jail. And they are tr basically trying to talk them out of filing a missing persons report, which, well, which is actually a no-no in some agencies. It's actually against policy for when, because it depends on policy to policy, it depends on jurisdiction to jurisdiction. The jurisdiction that I actually had exposure with and worked for, if the reporting party felt that the person was missing, then you completed a report. No debate, no question about it. But I don't know what, what this person was thinking. I don't know why this person was blindsiding. It seemed to me that they were blindsiding and, 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 and stonewalling daughter and all that well um, i think she's depressed that's what has me is that more what, that's worth that. you more than just mm -hmm. her okay that and the fact that she's in an area where she doesn't know where she's at yeah, does so. she take medication at all no she i i, I believe it's a state that she's in right now because of just the, the weird activity that's been you, going what, on what's her name with that. what's her, her name? name is her name is my tree okay Okay, and your name, ma'am? Latisse. Okay, Latisse. Here, here's what I want you to do. Let, yeah. get, why don't you wait a couple hours and, and give us some time to kind of, I'll go back and talk to the jailer and try and get a timeline of when she was released and, you know, make sure she's not asleep in our lobby or anything like that. And then why don't you give us a call back in a couple hours if she hasn't shown up okay. or made contact with you, then maybe we can do something for you, okay? Yeah, hi. Hey, uh, this is uh, uh, Smith at Cold Canyon. We had a prowler walking around through the backyard here, but we don't know what the situation was. I uh, don't know if you had a unit in the area. It might do a little drive-by or something. <clears throat> okay, where's this at? This is Cold Canyon, like hot and cold in Monte Nito. Um, and it's in the back of the house, uh, which is right where Wood Bluff hits, the, hits uh, Cold Canyon. So Cold Canyon and Wood Bluff, they get a call. Uh, in from a resident that is um, suggesting that a radio car be sent out. Okay, that be sent out just to check the area for the existence of somebody that's there that probably, well, you know, in their mind didn't belong there. They basically wanted a well-being check, it sounds to me, that they wanted to, they didn't know what was going on. They saw who it was. And let me read you the... Uh, Wikipedia. By the way, you're, uh, this is the Congenitus Chronicles. I am the Congenitus today. And I go by Bobby Sage here. My Therese LaVon Richardson was a 24-year-old woman who went missing on September 17, 2009 after being released from a Calabasas 
California jail where she had been taken after behaving erratically at a restaurant. She was subsequently found deceased 11 months later in August 2010. So, several months later she was found dead. And there's still no accountability at all behind this. We'll go further. Uh, and uh, we just had a strange woman walk up to the backyard here. This is a fairly large property, and she was sitting on the steps right, right on the back of the house here. Uh, this is kind of a circular driveway, and the gates were closed, so we don't know where this woman came from. Did you see the cross was Wood Bluff? Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, there, there's a, a horse trail, ac hiking trail access through here, but we've never had this kind of happen, thing happen before. Uh, what she look like? White, black, and uh, uh, You know, a tall, slim, black woman with Afro hair. Uh, how tall? Uh, well, I thought she was sitting down, stretched out on the wooden steps in the back of the house, hard to tell. But uh, she looked like she might have been medium to slightly tall, uh, with a big afro hair, very skinny. And, uh, I think she was wearing maybe jeans or tight pants with a t-shirt. You've, you've never seen her there before? No, never. Nobody ever does that. I mean, the, the people hike on the trail all the time. We, you know, the trail goes through our property, but we leave it open on purpose because it's kind of a nice thing for horses and people. And you said she's laying across the, she was laying across the steps, or? But she was sitting, kind of sprawled out on the, on the wooden steps in the back of the house, right against the back of the house. She's yeah. since got up and left? Uh, she's since gone, yeah. She's been gone about five minutes now, but as we thought it over, we thought maybe a little drive-by wouldn't be a bad idea. And what direction was she, she last seen headed? Never saw her. She, well, once she left, she just dis disappeared. Very simple request, right? Very simple request. It's just a request that area patrol units would drive, do a drive-by of the area and check on the whereabouts of this young woman. Simplest thing that you can do. It's the simplest thing that one can do is just do a simple drive-by to locate somebody that um, is unfamiliar to the area, that might be lost, what have you. Just to give you some background on this area that I just looked it up, centrally located between Malibu and Calabasas. And it's uh, set at the heart of, in the heart of Montanito, Montanito, M-O-N-T-E-N-I-D-O. So this is an upscale area with uh, large, large estates, large homes, and it's a mountainous area. From what I remember, from what I'm seeing here, as I do like a, a map search, and it's very remote, it's off of Malibu Canyon, Malibu Canyon Road, and uh, Cold Canyon. Malibu Canyon Road, Payuma Road, and it's uh, somewhere off the beaten path, I mean, quite extensively, near Malibu Creek and that. Safe to say it's a very highly remote area, a long way from Mulholland Highway even, south of Mulholland Highway, as I'm looking at a map, basically doing a flyover, if you will. Very highly remote area, widely spread out, uh, exclusive to say the least near pretty much nothing nothingness out there out there that's that would explain why well it took 11 months to recover uh, at least parts of her body I'm not even sure they got all of her remains but they're saying the remains were found on August 9th in 2010 this case was nine years ago and the reason why this this plays into uh, what we're seeing today is because Kamala Harris was the ranking, the highest law enforcement law enforcement officer in the state at the time, being the AG or the Attorney General. And with all the corruption that had been going on without, you know, in this era, especially associated with uh, former Sheriff Lee Baca, who I believe is either serving a federal prison term or is trying to stay out of one or will soon be facing one, there was rampant corruption at the time. And you have to understand that in this era of post-Rampart scandal and other ensuing scandals since that have occurred in this area, you have to have lived under a rock to not realize that these types of things were happening as far as uh, malfeasance. I'm going to refrain from actually uh, offering my own conclusion here, but what's chiefly 
what chiefly stands out in my mind is what they should have done is simply taken this young woman in for a mental, uh, a mental health assessment if they felt that. I mean, that would have been the proper course of action. Or, or they could have simply taken her to a mutual spot, transported her to where her parents could have picked her up. Or left her, in, or, or monitored, monitored her in the station lobby, or kept her in the facility. From what I understand, it wasn't crowded. He could have kept her in there, kept her safe, kept her until the parents would have gotten there to the, to the location, to the substation to pick her up. Uh, we, I moved from one window to another. I said to her, I, I hollered down, are you all right? And she said, I'm just resting or something like that. Uh, but uh, she's certainly gone out of her way to get to that close to the house because the, the hiking trail is not that close. It's on the ridge. All right, we'll go ahead and check the area for her. Appreciate that very much. Not a problem, sir. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Now let me let me pause let me pause for one second, fam, because understand one thing. See back understand now. one thing. A single black woman, very skinny, is considered a prowler. Right now we have to go to like why a single black woman, very thin woman, that's a prowler around your house. This is a KTLA um, anchor, I think, also who made this call. Now I want you to I want you to pay close attention to one other thing. You heard the mother crying, saying, you know, I'm looking for my child. The, the audio, for whatever reason, skipped ahead. And what you don't hear, and what I'm going to try to play back for you now, you do not hear the first call from the mother. The first call, from the, the second call with the mother when she's crying and she's saying, you release my child. You have to understand that in the context of the first call, which I'm going to try to play right now, because you have to understand the context of it all, not just one part of it. Guest here who is refusing to pay her bill, and we think she may. I mean, she sounds really crazy. She may be on drugs or something. Um, we are wondering if someone can come by and pick her up. Okay. Well, what's the address here? It's two seven four zero zero Pacific Coast Highway. And uh, is she a white, black, Asian, Hispanic? She's um, young black girl. She's probably in her twenties. Okay. What's she wearing? She's wearing a black T-shirt and I think blue jeans. Is she with anybody else? No, it's just her. I am calling. I'm a little frazzled right now. I understand my daughter is being brought into the station. My three Richard sons have they made it to the station yet, and she's been booked. Okay. Is, is, do you know where she's coming from? Uh, it's some restaurant out in Malibu, and I, I didn't even think to get the name. The okay, manager yeah, came the only, in. The only place we have somebody that's in custody that they just announced on the radio that they're coming up is from Joffrey's. In the Pacific Coast Highway, it's okay. the only female that's being brought up to the station as we speak. They actually just put on the radio right before you called. Okay, okay. I'm I'm her mother, oh, okay. and are you guys going to book her and then release her on her own re recognizance tonight? Because it, it, it's dark. She doesn't have a car, and I don't want her wandering out. I'm I'm totally just taking a bath because this is so out of character for her. Yeah. And you'll see when she comes in, she she's well spoken. I think the only way I will come and get her tonight is if you guys are going to release her tonight. Yeah. If it's going to be held in custody for some type of arraignment tomorrow, mm -hmm. then I will wait until tomorrow. She definitely has no place, you know, I mean, she's not from that area, and I would hate to <laughs> wake up to a morning report, so yeah. lost somewhere with her head chopped off, uh -huh. so I guess I would have to come and get her. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, we're in a great hills. The only uh, thing is, at least in the station here, she will be separated, so nobody's going to be with her. Uh, so at least that's, you know, the plus thing, so you don't have to worry about her safety. I don't want my daughter lost somewhere with her head chopped off. And, you know, we have to stop this whole thing. Like, if we don't do one other thing, people, we got to stop this whole thing of blaming black people first. The reason she called in, because she wanted to find out if you're going to release her tonight. If you're going to release her tonight, I'm coming tonight. If you're not going to release her till in the morning, I have another child at home, and there's no reason for me to come. If you're going to have her arraigned or something, there's no reason. That's a perfectly, that's the, that's the, that is the most sensible thing to do. If you're not going to release my child tonight, I'm not coming tonight. But I'm coming there tonight if you release her tonight. I don't want her outside alone. I want to be there when she gets out. Is she going to be here? Okay. Nobody said, 
and and it's a given it like no 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 she's 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 just coming in she's not going to be released or whatever 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 then you find out she did get released into the night when the whole point of your specific call was for her not to be released and then the second part of it is this lazy this lazy donut eating dude on the phone is like well you know well I, you know, and, and when the when the whole the, the the other part of it, the missing call, is like, well, I wouldn't put in a missing persons report. Like, give it like two hours. When you hear somebody, when you hear a police officer say, give it two hours, that means like, give it long enough to where I'm not on shift no more because I don't want to deal with it. Where's the? And that's precisely uh, precisely the impression that I got listening to that. Although missing person reports are fairly extensive in nature by comparison to standard run-of-the-mill radio calls because they do require some time because it requires gathering all the facts, gathering all the information as much information as is available. And once you gather that information, you get on the phone to your records bureau and you pass along that information, at which point you're passed along a reference number. I believe if I remember right, it's because it's been it's been a long time, but it's a essentially a NCIC number that you're provided with. You're provided with a records number. And that all the information that you've provided goes into pretty much a national registry for missing people. And there's a reason for that is to aid and facilitate in locate locating the person that's missing. There is a process involved. And these deputies, all of them that were on the watch that night, were deficient in following out what was with what was decent and what was compassionate. And they showed, in my opinion, they showed a deliberate indifference to this young woman who was in need of help, but they treated her like a criminal suspect. They treated her less than. Because the comparison that was drawn here on um, Yvette Carnell's broadcast, and by the way, I'm going to again say this was a great piece of investigative journalism. I do agree with that, definitely. But there was a, a young woman by the name of Natalie Holloway. Now, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't, you know, I didn't really piece everything together, but it's been, an, you know, a number of years since even that's happened. And her case was international. And it seemed to me, my perception of that, my whole impression of that is that they, they gathered up the masses for that case. And this was an international case. And she was on vacation somewhere. She was white. She was blonde. And what? 19 to 25 We know about that particular uh, edict, right? White, blonde, and 23. Didn't Dick Gregory talk about that in the past before? Or um, Paul Mooney? If you're white, blonde, and 23 in America, you'll get a pass. And it's obvious to me that my trees, Sandra Bland, and so many others have, even most recently with this young woman in freezing cold weather, below freezing in Detroit, Michigan, that was pulled over by, well, what's known to be and what's been categorized as race soldiers. She was stopped for a, 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 a how shall I say it, a, a petty violation a lapse in registration payment, an administrative violation. It wasn't anything punitive. She was stopped for expired tags in sub freezing temperatures. And, in, and they impounded her car. Sure. The, 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 the officers are offered her a ride home, right? But she declined it. And it was probably the smartest thing she did just to let you know what, what, a person's mindset is to decline a ride home after they've impounded your car. You're going to decline a ride home 
in in, in sub degree in, in, in sub freezing temperatures. What does that tell you about the public trust of the police now? Now, some would be foolish to say, oh, that's her fault. She decided, decided to walk. No, she didn't believe that she would be, you know, serviced. I mean, that, that service would be rendered to her, that she would probably be, be harmed. You know, you hear, you hear all the stories of, of, you know, police abducting black women all the time or, or in recent years anyway. There's a case in, in what, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And they're trying to get that officer a uh, Holtzclaw. They're trying to spring him from 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 uh from jail time from prison time. They're trying to there, there's there's an effort to try to get him out of prison. Because why? Because well they 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 feel that he didn't do it. They feel that basically there, there's a devaluation of those women that he contacted. They were categorizing those women as street denizens. So yes, I'm going to tell you, friends. There is a a class struggle, and it's predicated on race here in America. That's It's obvious. And by virtue of this and this alone, it's a substantial reason why uh, Senator Kamala Harris should not be uh, considered for the highest office in the land. I mean, her, her, her prosecutorial record is just shoddy. And this right here is part of it. She didn't pursue justice for Mytrice Richardson. She wasn't interested in gaining justice. I'm going to try to post the links uh, to the stories I pulled up related to this matter in um, in the description here. But I'm just going to play a little bit more uh, for your edification this uh, today, this morning. And uh, I'll chime in as, as, as we go along here. Should be coming up just a second. Where's the accountability in that? Where is the accountability in any of what we're dealing with? There is no accountability. You big pudgy don't not even little man. Like you just didn't want to deal with it. And then you all said that like, no, you are not. No, she'll be fine. She'll be safe here. You notice she got brought in for mental issues. She said drunk. That woman said she's drunk or crazy. They did a sobriety test, so she wasn't drunk. That means she was having a severe mental breakdown. She was talking about Mars and Michael Jackson, and she was going to Hawaii. Like, if you read it, she was saying things that let you know, okay, this person is having a mental break. You let somebody who was having a mental break outside. In the middle of the night, unfamiliar territory, no money, no phone, just out. And when that father calls, you say something to the fact that we're not a babysitter. And that's the black woman, I think, who said that. If we want to talk about sisterhood, we're not babysitters here. But the mama called and said, I don't want my child to be outside. Y'all could have just called the mama and said, listen, we got to let her go. We don't have no room. You got to come pick her up. And that moment that I heard on that call would have picked her baby up. And that didn't happen. And then not only did it not happen, everything that did happen didn't get investigated by your sister girl. So you want to go to Howard University and announce, and what, from what I see, this case was not thoroughly investigated. Everything from how she was released to the coroners not being there and the, and the regular police picking up, picking up bodies. And the mother went back to the crime scene and found her daughter's finger bone. And this, my friends, this is how it all ties into Kamala Harris. That she she was trying to set up a memorial and find her daughter's finger bone. Nobody wants to talk about this sloppy work and everything was done. And then one of the guys, the chief, whoever it was, got promoted. Not by people were getting promoted around this. There was no accountability. Paul there Tanaka. was only careerism. And we have to have that conversation. You know, that was a great time to have a black woman in office, except we didn't. What's the point of electing somebody, American DOS, and she's not dead? We know, we know Kamala's not dead. Or what's the point of electing somebody that went to Howard University if you're not going to do the right thing when you have a sister here? This is, this, is an, this is a black girl. Black, I don't care, 24, you still a kid, man. I remember myself at 24. I ain't know nothing. 
Like you still young. What's the point if you're not going to protect young sisters? Don't call yourself black if you're not going to do this. Well, I did this interview. I did this. I did this. I did. No. Don't call me your sister if you're not doing a thorough and you need to sign that paperwork yourself. Sign that paperwork yourself. Yeah, what Yvette was talking about here is that um, Mitrice's father had some correspondence with, uh, with Kamala uh, Harris. I wrote her a letter after there were some documents that were sent up that were um, the family had done a separate uh, additional investigation surrounding Mitrice's death. And somewhere in excess of around 500 uh, pages of documents that were sent up. And um, she said, the Harris's office, Harris and, and her office said that they reviewed the documents and they didn't come up with anything conclusive. So Mitrice's uh, father sent just uh, a letter on his own, an additional letter, a separate letter. Basically, you know, to to try to appeal for uh, further inquiry into, in, into this case. Still, it seemed to have uh, fallen on deaf deaf ears. That's what has to happen. Now, I'm gonna. I know we're an hour in. Um, give me a give me a couple of seconds. Um, to 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 reorient the. The calls, and then we're gonna take we're gonna take some calls. I'm gonna have a conversation with you all about what you all thought about the interview, what you think should have happened, where we go from here, and all of that sort of thing. Give me two minutes. We'll be right back. All right. So that was that was um, the YouTube presentation from Yvette Carnell, Breaking Brown. Uh, it's entitled Part Two: Kamala, The Risk, uh, where she interviews my Therese, my Therese Richardson's dad, Michael, uh, about the death of his daughter and the tie-in to presidential candidate Kamala Harris. Well, that's all I have for right now. And um, hopefully, I, I, I hope to look into this, to this even further. Again, I'm going to post some links in the, um, in the description here and get all that together for you uh, so you can do your own uh, inquiry and uh, maybe even keep pressure on, uh, send this to Kamala Harris, uh, information about you know, the fact that she overlooked this, right? Something that needs some, uh, some attention. And, and this case does need to be reopened and, uh, reinvestigated in my view. So for now, the Code Genovese Chronicles, I'm your host, Bobby Sage. See you next time.